Welcome to the Creative Pen Podcast. I'm Joanna Penn, thriller author and creative entrepreneur, bringing you interviews, inspiration and information on writing, publishing options and marketing ideas for your book. You can find the episode show notes, your free author blueprint and lots more information at thecreativepen.com and that's pen with a double N. And here's the show. Hello creatives, I'm Joanna Penn and this is episode number 735 of the podcast and it is Tuesday the 23rd of January 2024 as I record this early as I will be travelling for book research as this goes out. In today's show I have an interview with Paddy Finn on how to be successful on Kickstarter which I'm excited to share as you know how much I think Kickstarter and selling direct is so important for our future as independent authors. Paddy talks about the importance of the pre-launch page, how to make sure your campaign is profitable, the benefits and the challenges of direct connection with your audience, as well as the survival of the most adaptable, which is an attitude I love as we all need to pivot and change. Nothing stays the same. And he has some great tips for Kickstarter and selling direct if you're interested in this route. So that's coming up in the interview section and I now have a resources page for Kickstarter, Shopify and Selling Direct at thecreativepen.com forward slash sell direct resources. Lots of links there. So in publishing, book marketing and AI, well, something interesting in the Financial Times this week piqued my little futurist brain, an article titled Streaming Due for a Streamlining. Now, keep in mind that the music industry is usually a few years ahead of the book industry. So music went to MP3s before books went to um, EPUB, basically. But here's uh, a quote from the article. So this is the Financial Times. It is behind a paywall. There is a link in the show notes. Spotify plans to cull millions of barely listened to tracks as the big labels focus on artists with super fans. Much of the catalogue is barely listened to at all. Out of the 184 million total (laughs) audio tracks available, more than 150 million songs, so that is the over three quarters, received only a thousand streams or fewer in 2023. Some 46 million songs received zero streams. One of the more controversial elements of this model being investigated is demonetizing. In other words, stop paying for songs that are not streamed much. If tools to create AI-generated songs take off among fans and regular people, there could easily be a future in which thousands of tracks by an AI copy of Drake are added to Spotify, receive four streams and are instantly forgotten about – With these rules in place, the music industry has preemptively removed such tracks from the financial equation. So I read that (laughs) and I thought it was pretty easy to see the equivalence of this in the ebook and digital audio industry. So at the moment, even if you get, say, four reads or page reads on uh, KU or you get some listens, to your audiobook, you're going to get paid even a tiny, tiny, tiny amount, like a micro payment. You won't get paid it or accrue until you hit like a ten dollar uh, level. So it's interesting that that might be a model that's coming. It is not inconceivable to suggest that the retailers, and not just Amazon, but all of them, might they decide that they don't want to accrue and pay these micro payments to the smallest sellers. That perhaps if you don't sell more than I don't know, 100 copies per year, then that just might be (laughs) ignored. I'm not saying this will happen. I'm just saying it is an interesting thought experiment. And it's certainly one way to deal with what is an inevitable uh, lot of AI generated content in all spheres. Some more interesting news. The Hollywood Reporter reports on a potential licensing deal. The Authors Guild is exploring a model for its members to opt in to the offering of a blanket license to artificial intelligence companies for use of content to build chatbots. Early discussions involve a fee to use works as training materials and a prohibition on outputs that borrow too much from existing material. 
We have to be proactive because generative AI is here to stay, said Mary Reisenberger, chief executive of the organisation, in an interview with The Hollywood Reporter. They need high quality books. Our position is that there's nothing wrong with the tech, but it has to be legal and licensed. I will just repeat that line because this is completely not what I was expecting from the Authors Guild. (laughs) She says, there's nothing wrong with the tech, but it has to be legal and licensed. So I, I have been saying this since 2020. I put it into my book on AI. We have to license our content rather than trying to shut this down. And I hope that, I mean, that's just in the USA, the Authors Guild. So I hope that there'll be something similar in the UK. Um, so it's something I'm sort of actively looking into. Now, one of the companies doing all these licensing deals is OpenAI. And if you'd like to hear Sam Altman, CEO of OpenAI, which makes ChatGPT, uh, he's talking to Bill Gates about where AI is going in the Unconfuse Me podcast, which is Bill Gates's pretty new podcast, actually. Uh, Sam Altman points to multimodality is developing this year, the ability to work across text, images, audio, and eventually video, which, as I've mentioned, is probably going to be the major acceleration this year. It's a really good interview with two very knowledgeable men about technology and what's going on with AI. And uh, I thought it was fascinating. These guys have seen the next level of what might be coming later this year. So yeah, try to read between the lines in terms of what they say about the future. Also, voice cloning startup Eleven Labs lands $80 million and achieves unicorn status as reported in TechCrunch. Now, Eleven Labs, you hopefully will have heard of Eleven Labs. They're the uh, favoured AI voice platform for uh, indie authors, for sure. Um, They are investing in versions of their speech generating tech aimed at creating audiobooks, dubbing films and TV shows, as well as generating character voices for games and marketing. Eleven Labs is also going to have a marketplace for voices, currently in alpha, set to become more widely available in the next weeks. The marketplace allows users to create a voice, verify and share it. When others use it, the original creators receive compensation. So here is my chance to license my voice, (laughs) which I'm not planning on doing at the moment, but never say never. Now, as I said, it's known in the community that the quality of Eleven Labs audio is the best, but the files are not accepted by ACX and they are not accepted by Findaway or Spotify, Findaway Voices, which is now owned by Spotify. So you can pretty much only sell those files direct. You can also put them on Kobo. So yes, this investment might be the beginning of acceptance, and I really hope so because I've been waiting to see how this shakes out. I do not want to have to create different files for different platforms. Uh, That is just crazy. But if Eleven Labs Audio can be used on Findaway and Spotify, that will be a great option for indies. And many are already using the Google Play Audio files, which are allowed for AI voices, but there aren't many voices or accents, and it's not so versatile. So I'm going to keep waiting, and I'm going to give it a few months. I, I I think things will change. Uh, I think this is a very interesting thing. I'm also going to be on a panel with a Spotify panel at London Book Fair. So that will give me a good chance to have a chat with them as well. And uh, yeah, see if things might be changing in the future. I totally understand why Findaway and Spotify are going with Google Play Audio. I mean, that's obviously the model is very clearly available for this type of use. But hopefully they might do a deal in the future with Eleven Labs. So in personal news, as this goes out, I am on a book research trip (laughs) through Vienna, Nuremberg and Cologne. Uh, And this is mostly for Spear of Destiny, my next arcane thriller, but also Gothic cathedrals, since uh, Cologne Cathedral, one of the most beautiful in the world, is featured in Tomb of Relics. And I wrote those scenes based on the website. So I'm very excited to go and see it. You can see my pictures at Instagram and Facebook at JF Penn Author. Now, if you don't know the story, the Spear of Destiny is the spear that supposedly pierced Jesus' side uh, on the cross, and the Roman centurion who wielded it, Longinus, was healed, and the spear was handed down over millennia and has been held by warmongering conquerors like the Emperor Constantine, Charlemagne, and of course, Hitler and the occult loving Nazis. So, The history says that the Allies took control of the spear after it had been taken to Nuremberg, and then it went back to the Hofburg in Vienna. 
or did it? <laughs> Therein lies a possible conspiracy thriller. So that is fun. Um, I'm getting the stories kind of starting to form in my head and the characters and all of that. But uh, I love to go and do my research in person. That is part of the reason I'm an author after all. <laughs> So interestingly enough, I am going to launch this on Kickstarter. Paddy and I talk about my pre-launch page. I wanted to have it up for the new year, actually, uh, but it's not up yet. It will be up in the next few weeks. I've had a Kickstarter only. So I'm going to do a Kickstarter only cover for this launch. Um, It will be a special edition hardback. It will have silver foil on the cover. It will have a ribbon bookmark and hopefully sprayed edges, which book vault Uh, might be putting that in, as well as an extended author's note essay uh, with my process and also photos of the places that inspired the story, which will include Washington, D.C. and Vienna, Austria. They'll be in the book. So this is going to be a really sort of a special edition that is only available in the Kickstarter and I won't be selling it separately afterwards. And then all the other books will have uh, the normal cover So I'm pretty excited about that and I I should have the pre-launch page up at once I get back. So thanks for your emails and comments. There aren't too many from uh, yesterday's show because as I record this early. (laughs) But some earlier comments Angela said of the interview with Joe Solari a few weeks back. I connected to your conversation about thinking carefully about what you need to live your best author life. When you cross the author threshold, there's a focus on striving to grow your brand, your readership and to produce exceptional product. You buckle down and work hard to serve and honour readers who've placed their trust in you. And as your readership grows, you never let off the gas. There's this idea that more is always better. For some authors, though, this means things get to a point where all the spinning plates and responsibility is unsustainable. They feel a bit stuck not wanting to disappoint their audience, but also knowing they've crossed into burnout and definitely aren't living their best author life. There's less conversation about this because authors in this situation find it hard to be open about what they're feeling. Yeah, I think um, I'm glad that resonated, Angela. And uh, yeah, we did, her comment goes on to sort of think about guilt in terms of many dream at being at the level of it being too hard as an author. So you you find it difficult to, to share that. The reality is struggle comes in all forms and happens at all stages, even when the author, author is successful. So yeah, that was, uh, I'm glad you found that interesting. Uh, also, I like this email from Corinna, who said, I haven't tuned into your podcast for a while. In 2016, I made a pivot. Uh, and I'm glad I found you again. <laughs> I thought I always find I always love this people email sometimes and say oh I've I've come back after years and you're still here (laughs) and Karina says I did a little binge this weekend while walking in minus 11 degrees centigrade minus 23 degrees with wind chill (laughs) um yes okay that's great I needed something to motivate me to go outside and your podcast did the trick I wore ski goggles to keep my eyes from freezing oh my goodness that's crazy thank you for listening (laughs) And then Paul said, I listened to your podcast during my three and a half hour commute from the office in Kent back to Somerset. Wow, that's hardcore. Your suggestions have been really useful. I'm a hobby author, but try to apply professional standards to whatever I do. I like that attitude, Paul. That's fantastic. So I love to hear from you and you can leave a message on the podcast show notes at thecreativepen.com or a comment. Uh, You can also comment on the YouTube channel. You can email me, send me pictures of where you're listening, joanna at thecreativepen.com. I love to hear from you. It makes this more of a conversation. So this episode is sponsored by Kobo Writing Life. And before I get into the kind of official ad, I want to be clear about my Kickstarter strategy when it comes to Kobo and the other retailers. When I, while I publish first on Kickstarter and Shopify, I absolutely then publish wide to all the other places, including Kobo Writing Life, which I've been using for over a decade to reach readers all around the world. Since they have the widest reach in terms of countries served, and I've sold in 176 countries through Kobo, I sell ebooks and audiobooks there, plus I distribute to libraries and I'm in their Kobo Plus program, which is non-exclusive. So back to the official ad. This episode is sponsored by Kobo Writing Life, Kobo's free, fast and easy self-publishing platform. 
KWL was built by authors for authors, and their team of dedicated book lovers is always working hard to help you reach new readers around the world. Right now, digital books are reaching more people than ever, and libraries are becoming an integral part of that. You can easily reach library readers in your KWL account and earn 50% on every library sale, as there's no aggregator fee. Your book will be available to librarians to purchase for multi-loan use, but also for a one-time checkout option. If you're interested in taking part in library promotions, email KWL's dedicated author care team at writinglife at kobo.com and they'll add you to the mailing list. Don't forget to tell your readers they can pick up your book in libraries. And yes, you can pick up my books in libraries. If you want to learn more about KWL, check out the Kobo Writing Life podcast, available wherever you get your shows and find them on social. Create your free account today at kobo.com forward slash writing life. This type of corporate sponsorship pays for the hosting, transcription and editing, but my time as ever in creating the show is sponsored by my community at patreon.com forward slash the creative pen. Thanks to the three new patrons who've joined since I recorded the last show (laughs) just a few days ago. Thanks to everyone who's been supporting for months and years. We are heading toward a thousand people now in the community. Last week, I put out the patron only Q&A, which is an extra solo show answering all your questions about writing craft, business and, of course, AI. If you join the community, you get all of that, the backlist videos and audio, and also you get the backlist of my videos behind the scenes with AI, including uh, Claude, ChatGPT, Dali, and more. The Patreon is now a monthly subscription, the equivalent of a black coffee a month or a couple of coffees if you're feeling generous. So if you get value from the show and you want more, come on over and join us. Thanks to everyone who's been supporting for years and months and to new patrons, you are amazing. And I'm so glad you still find the show useful after all this time. Join us at patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com forward slash The Creative Pen. Right, let's get into the interview. Paddy Finn is the author of science fiction and fantasy novels, the CEO of Penny Dragon Games and Starcane Press, and is a Kickstarter expert. So welcome to the show, Paddy. Well, it's awesome to be here, Joe. Thanks for having me. Oh, no, I'm so excited to talk to you about Kickstarter. But before we get into that, tell us a bit more about you, your writing and publishing background, and how the hell you manage your time, because you have so many companies doing a lot of products. (laughs) First of all, I don't know how I manage my time. (laughs) Yeah, it's a strange one, because I started writing and fantasy and science fiction novels back in like 2015, 2016. Like lots of authors, I'd been writing ever since I was a kid and could pick up a pen or a pencil. But I started to hear about the self-publishing thing and I may have started listening to the Creative Pen podcast, a few other podcasts around that time as well. So that kind of gave me some impetus to, to take this thing seriously. And then I went to a few conferences and they really encouraged me. And come 2018, I went full time as an indie author and did very well for a few years and then saw another opportunity in a slightly, let's call it an adjacent market, I guess, where Kickstarter was doing very well for some people who were creating content for Dungeons and Dragons. And I'd been playing Dungeons and Dragons for like seven or eight years at that stage and figured, hey, I like this thing. It's writing plus a little bit of game design and it's similar, but also different and it's a new challenge so let's give that a try and it exploded as soon as we tried it really so that was kind of an indicator that hey we should keep doing this thing because it's working so we kept doing that thing and so starcane press is your publishing house that's correct so starcane press is kind of like a combination of star and arcane because we like to work on science fiction and fantasy um And to be honest, when we started with the whole Kickstarter thing and the new industry, really, it took us away from novel publishing. And only in the last kind of six to 12 months have we started to circle back to that. And it's been a bit slow going, but 2024 is going to be a year where we will really focus again on novels. So we're looking forward to that. Mm. So for someone like me, who is, uh, I mean, obviously, I've heard of Dungeons and Dragons, but I don't really understand 
what p- kind of products you're creating. So tell us, like, what are the products you have been doing for the games? Like, what is the thing you're actually selling? It's primarily books, hardcover books, but also PDFs. We've been leaning very heavily on digital content, specifically PDFs, in the past 6 to 12 months. However, the industry does love a hardcover book. And the great thing about those two things is that generally they're a much higher ticket item than a novel. So a hardcover game book could be anywhere from 40 to $60. If it's a special edition or like a premium cover, it could be over $100 per copy. And then your PDFs, they can be anywhere from $5 to $35 to $40, just depending on, on, on what's in there and how big it is and whatever the content is. But essentially, it's just a book. And Dungeons & Dragons, when I describe it to people, it's like writing, only you're doing it with four or five other people. And one person at the table is the narrator, and they control all of the minor characters and the antagonist. And then the other people at the table are players, and they control the main characters or the protagonists. So, And together, you just sit there, and through your imagination, you tell a joint story and create this awesome thing and it's an experience and it's a creative outlet for a lot of people who don't really get a creative outlet these days so I think Mm. it's appealing to a lot more people. Yeah and again I'm just fascinated before we get into Kickstarter because this is about products as well and as you said higher ticket items so are you writing the game for the narrator person to use as a kind of outline for the game? Exactly so it, it depends I mean there could be Let's say we have a world. One of the Kickstarters we launched last year did very well was like a Celtic setting book, which is just a world building book that says, hey, here is a Celtic flavored world. Here are a bunch of clans. This is inspired kind of by, let's say, we we kind of drew on the inspiration of Irish, Scottish, Manx, and a little bit of Cornwall kind of mythology. And we kind of said, well, here is, if you want to run a game like that in that kind of world, here are a bunch of locations and items and monsters and just lots of different things that you would encounter in those folk tales. And they're in this book, and you can take up, lift this book up, and you can now tell a story or run an adventure in this world because you have all the stuff there. That actually sounds really fun. <laughs> <laughs> I never did gaming. My brother did gaming. It's still games. And I w- often feel a little bit kind of jealous that I missed out on this stuff. And I know you can start any time and I should probably get into it now. But it's so interesting hearing about it in terms of the world building, because that, I mean, that is what we do as fiction authors. We create these worlds and have adventures in it. But you also mentioned, I guess, as part of the world building, do you offer physical items to go with the books, cards or little figures or are there other things you offer with them? Oh, we do. And it, it, to be honest with you, it's not necessary, but I tend to get a little carried away with shiny new things. <laughs> I guess a lot of authors have magpie syndrome, and I am foremost among them. <laughs> but yeah, so we would have the book, and the, the sort of core offering is the book in PDF form or hardcover. And usually we'll also offer like a, an alt cover. Uh, standard version which is it's just a standard book with a different cover on it essentially and that might be like a limited edition so it's a bit more and then a premium cover which might be like leather bound or leatherette and on top of that we might do dice dice trays dice vaults miniatures maps posters card decks with monsters or spells or magic items on them really it's whatever your imagination can come up with and whatever people want to invest in. So we've experimented with a lot of things. Like we've seen other people in the market do certain things that worked well and we've gone, hey, let's try that. But also we've tried our own things. Like the the Celtic campaign, uh, Celtic inspired one that we launched last year that I referenced before. We That was the first time, oh no, it wasn't. It was the second time we tried making a plushie. We made a little leprechaun plushie. <laughs> and a little, a little puka plushie, and a puka is just like a little gremlin type creature, and that was a lot of fun. It's amazing when you go to a manufacturer and you go through. You have to learn how to design the drawings for these things and who to work f- with, and it's similar to doing a novel in that you work with an artist, you work with different people to help you 
in, in different stages of creating your product. And then you work with a bunch of people, it goes through this process, and then you, you end up with a leprechaun plushie in your hand. And you're like, wow, how did that happen? <laughs> <laughs> and, and we should say to people, you are Northern Irish, right? I so am. I you're am. allowed to do this. It's not cultural yes. appropriation. <laughs> no, it is. We, we actually, we were running some ads and we got in a lot of trouble. Yeah, with I some imagine. of those ads. Yeah. <laughs> A whole lot of Irish people who were very annoyed. Yeah, there were a lot of people annoyed. A lot of people who weren't Irish as well, and they were like, "This is racist," and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And I'm like, "I'm Irish. I'm like one one of the most Irish people. You know, I speak the language, I play the music, I live in the country. Yeah, Give me some slack, please. Slack off. <laughs> yeah. No, I just wanted to point that out, and also for your accent, if people were wondering. So let's we're going to circle back to the merchandise because I'm so interested in that. But just in terms of what what is happening in the author ecosystem, because obviously there's people like you, Russell Nolte, and people who've been doing Kickstarters for years, and then I don't know, maybe it was Brandon Sanderson who started it going really mainstream. But in the indie author community, what have you seen like in the last year? Why do you think Kickstarter and direct sales is really taking off? I think it's a combination of things. So I think it's to do with the industry life cycle partially. So in the publishing, I guess you could say it really had its heyday or its golden age in the kind of early to mid-teens. I mean, that's not to say that you can't be incredibly successful now doing that because lots of people are doing exactly just that. But there are a lot more people that the tools that exist today that make it very accessible did not exist back then. So there weren't as many people doing it. So that creates a lot of competition. And whereas I, I don't encourage that anyone ever shy away from competition, because for me, competition is just an opportunity. It does make it a bit more difficult if you are coming at it like brand new. Also, I think because the industry has changed in terms of, for example, the big player in the room is Amazon and they aren't always the easiest to work with. They demand a lot in terms of if you want full access to their audience, they want you to be exclusive. Exclusive, yeah. Yeah, on KU or whatever. And I think we've seen a lot of people move wide over the years, and that's just increased and increased as people want more autonomy and control over their intellectual property and over their income, really, because if you do direct sales, then yeah, there's a there's an upfront cost involved, there's more admin, etc. But you don't have to pay a royalty to Amazon. You get the royalty. Obviously, there are some sales fees and whatnot, depending on your platform. But you, there's a lot more control. And if you're an indie, I mean, you're independent. So you have to ask yourself, well, am I independent or am I an Amazon publisher? Because those aren't necessarily the same thing. And I make it in, a, in a trouble with a lot of indie people for saying that. But Oh, not you know. on this show. <laughs> Good. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I've always been super wide. And, uh, and I think you're right about the maturity of the retailer-centric indie author model. That's the only way I'd re- rephrase it. That sort of focus on a few retailers is what's changing. And being an independent author is now a much bigger and more creative prospect. And that's, I think, why I'm so attracted to the Kickstarter and direct sales model is now there's all these things we can do. And like you said, the tools are... <laughs> Have expanded but it is not all rainbows and unicorns it uh, you mentioned some costs and admin involved so let's just be clear about this when you're using the retailers you do pay a certain amount of money in terms of when you sell a book they take a percentage and you might have to pay for ads and all of this but there are benefits you don't have to deal with a lot of customer support and all of that so what are the main differences and what do people almost underestimate if they decide to go the kickstarter and direct sales route It's a bit of a double-edged sword, this one, but you kind of touched on it with the customer support side of things. So if you're using a huge retailer, generally you don't have access to customer data or your customers at all, really. That's kind of hidden behind their system. And like you said, a benefit to that is you don't have to deal with the customers. The flip side of that is you can't contact the customers, tell them about this awesome thing you're working on. You can't. It's very difficult to promote your stuff because you don't know you know, how, how, if I launch something, or Amazon going to share it? How does the Amazon algorithm work? There's a lot of guesswork involved. Whereas when it comes to direct sales or Kickstarter or anything of that nature, 
you do have a lot more visibility on your customer base. That's one of the things I keep telling people about Kickstarter is that's one of the things. I mean, I'm not affiliated with Kickstarter, by the way, in any official capacity or anything. They don't pay me to talk about Kickstarter or anything like that. But I just the platform has so many things going for it, such as that visibility. And to me, that is one of the key benefits of Kickstarter is you can contact all of your customers or fans or backers or whatever you want to call them. And that audience ownership is extremely important, especially in today's world. You know, people think if they have a following on YouTube or Amazon or TikTok, whatever it is these days, that that's their audience, but it's not their audience. That audience belongs to that platform. And if that platform decided to change something, your business could change drastically overnight because it could limit your reach or it could do something that negatively impacts your audience, right? Mm. And it negatively impacts your business, rather. So the great thing about Kickstarter is you have everyone's email addresses. If you're sending them stuff and delivering stuff, you have their physical addresses. You may have their contact number, right? So if Kickstarter was to change something one day that could maybe impact your business, well, you already have all the information you need to still contact those people. So audience ownership for Kickstarter is a huge plus, and I would even say it's maybe the biggest plus. But that does come with a number of challenges, and that is that you have to build that audience yourself. There is a little bit of organic reach on Kickstarter, and there are ways to leverage that, but it might not be the same as bigger platforms in terms of like Amazon. If you've built up a following on there for the last five to ten years, and then you launch a book, the hope would be that Amazon's going to promote that new book to the people who have purchased your previous books, and that still happens. So there, there's a benefit to that, but when it comes to Kickstarter, you do, in a lot of ways, you're st- you could, in a lot of ways, you're starting from scratch. But nothing worth doing is ever easy, and and, and also nothing lasts forever. The maturity of the industry that I started self-publishing in 2008, and then 2009 was really when Kindle really started taking off. I mean, that's the other thing. We all have to start again. Like I feel like I'm starting again on Kickstarter and Shopify and all of this. But that to me is the next 15 years. So I don't want people to think, oh, well, starting again is a bad thing. Starting again can be a really good thing. (laughs) Yeah, it it is great. And it's like they talk about survival of the fittest and whatnot. Mm. And they say it wasn't the survival of the fittest. It was the survival of the most adaptable. Mm. And it, it... that's the same for us. If you're operating in an industry and there are a lot of changes in that industry, well, if you adapt, you're going to be okay. And that just that does mean sometimes starting from scratch, and that's okay. I like that. The survival of the most adaptable, that's, that's definitely where we want to be. I mean, I'm like, okay, how am I going to look after my career for the next 15 years? And this is the way I see it. So let's get into a bit more detail. So you do have a great course, which we're going to talk about later. But one of the things that I think is <laughs> is is interesting so people think oh kickstarter it's like a magic bullet i'll just put up a thing it'll work and it'll be amazing but a lot of kickstarter campaigns do fail to fund so what are the most common mistakes and the things that authors in particular get wrong which means their campaigns don't fund the biggest mistake that most people including authors and even some very successful people on kickstarter they don't take advantage of something that is readily available to everyone and that is the pre-launch phase of a kickstarter campaign so anyone who isn't familiar with it is when you launch a kickstarter it goes live and you start promoting it when it launches and everyone goes well you hope that you tell a bunch of people to go to your kickstarter and they support you however there is a really powerful tool that's called your pre-launch page which you can set up three months six months ahead of time and kind of start building up a little bit of interest in that campaign in the months before it launches. So you have this chance to kickstart your Kickstarter, if you want to say, or give yourself this boost. And I see a lot of people maybe just doing it for a few days or a week, or just they don't do it at all. And I'm like, you're missing out on one of the biggest opportunities to promote your campaign. And one of those things is I say to people, your second most important day on your Kickstarter campaign is the day you launch. And the most important day is every day before that, because you can't just launch a Kickstarter and do a bunch of stuff on the first day and expect it to succeed. You have to lay a lot of groundwork in the lead up to the campaign. 
So it could be six weeks before or three months before. I think three months is a really good lead time. Six weeks, you can still accomplish an awful lot there. And essentially, all, all that happens is in a pre-launch page, it's just an image and a button and people can come along and follow. Oh, and a title. So they can tell what it is, really. And, the, mm. and if they are interested, they follow it. And it means on the day of launch, they receive a notification from Kickstarter saying, hey, this thing that you followed, it's launched now. Go, go check it out. And that can be incredibly powerful. And, and, to, and that makes, that could be for us, it's the difference between a five-figure campaign and a six-figure campaign. Which brings me on to a personal question, <laughs> because I totally get this. And I learned from Russell and Monica Lee now, and they said, do this. I set up my, so I've done two campaigns as we record this, both of which I had a, a long pre-launch, both of which funded like within a few minutes, because all those people, as you said, went and bought immediately. And thank you to all backers listening. But I just tried to set up my new campaign for a novel called Spear of Destiny. And I got an email, I tried to set it up, I clicked the button and they said, we can't let you put this pre-launch live and their email said in our review of your previous projects we found that backers are still awaiting their rewards and I was like what I mean because I have fulfilled 99.9% of everything (laughs) so I was like what is the problem here so can you tell me what is the problem (laughs) so there are a few issues here so first of all if you've only run like a few kickstarters they are a little more cautious. Uh, once you've run like four or five, it's a bit more flexible and they can see, hey, you've got a solid track record, so we don't really have a whole lot to worry about here. The other thing is sometimes it's just automated. So it may even say that, but it could be that an automation tool went and just did a... Oh no, I went back and forwards. You, you Okay. So yeah, also oh, so you've gone back a few times to them and they've still yeah, said... Yeah, I went back yeah. and said... and Well, the, okay, so what I thought was potentially the problem is that I did offer... I do have some consulting sessions outstanding mm-hmm. on my um, November Kickstarter, but they have a year to take those and there's only like eight people left out of mm-hmm. over a thousand backers. So I thought, well, that seems odd. And then I was wondering, there's this box. So when you log into Kickstarter, you can go yeah. to the pages you manage and there's a box mm-hmm. that says, I've received my stuff. Uh-huh. And I was thinking well maybe my backers just haven't clicked that box so could that be it <laughs> i don't think so um because i don't know anyone who ticks that box i just, know i was just... like <laughs> do we need to tell everyone to click that box I mean... my, like our backers <laughs> never tick those boxes so i think it could be maybe you're in contact with someone who's a little overzealous as well and to be honest with you like this is not unusual by the way this it's fairly normal and sometimes i find myself you know I say it gets easier when you've run a handful of campaigns. I mean, I've run over 20 and I still will get someone coming back to me and saying, hey, you know, et cetera, et cetera, same thing, same same kind of objection. And it Mm. could be that I need to like negotiate with them over three or four messages before they eventually go, okay, right, we can see you've got most of it done. But generally speaking, I haven't had any major trouble if I have fulfilled the core of my offering. So for example, yeah, if it was like a, it. mm. yeah, if, if it's like, here's a book and everyone's going to get a book, mm. right? The if, as long as you I do wondered, the book. <laughs> the other thing I wondered was I, I was pretty hardcore with this fulfillment. You know, I finished yeah. the book. I had, I actually ordered the printing of the books before receiving the money. Yeah. So I was able to sign them and send them out. So I was thinking, ah, maybe they just think I was too quick because. Ma- the- <laughs> I think, I think probably because I got that book when I got that book, I was like, whoa, I wasn't expecting it so soon. And you, the... were late, you were late one, so I couldn't get <laughs> I, your address. <laughs> I was. And even then, I couldn't believe it. So maybe you've just like gone... I've over-delivered. Because, yeah, you over-delivered. And they're like, this th- this person is, is joking. This can't be real. Yeah, they must be lying. Because, of course, a lot of people get the money and then they spend a year like doing the project or whatever. Yeah. So I think I, what I'm planning on doing, and just to encourage people listening, there are people on the other end of the Kickstarter and all of that. And I guess what I'm planning to do is just go back in at the end of the month and try again (laughs) yeah yeah i think you just need to send them a message as soon as they respond to you and just explain like and and another way to do this is i don't know which way you are planning on fulfilling the consultation but you could send a coupon or an email to say here is a here is the confirmation Ah, that you're Mm. getting this consultation and you just send them an email and say, I've sent them the coupon or the confirmation email of the consultation. So they now, that has been fulfilled, right? Ah, 
That is a very good tip because I was like, how on earth did I, you know, because you have to do, so people who haven't done one, you have to say whether you've shipped things. And so I was like, okay, like it, I, I, these are unfulfilled, but that's a great tip. So I'm going to do that. Okay. So coming back into the campaigns themselves, some Kickstarter campaigns do fund, but the author I've heard, I mean, I, I made a good profit, but some authors end up breaking even or sometimes they're even out of pocket. I've heard of mm-hmm. people who've actually lost money on campaigns. So how do people cost this out? How do they make sure a campaign is profitable? It can't be a bit of trial and error, um, especially because this industry especially from the literature and publishing side of things is still fairly new i mean we have a lot more information now than we did four or five years ago um when i sort of started to experiment with it so it can be a tricky one when it comes to costing but what you generally do is go go through a very basic kind of calculation where you're like okay so what is my average pledge going to be and the way you do that is you take your cheapest pledge and your highest pledge and you kind of meet somewhere in the middle and you go, okay, so if I get X number of backers then and, and they pledge an average of whatever that is, let's say it's $10, um, and I want to make whatever, then you can do that calculation. And then you can go, okay, well, I know then that I'm going to get roughly a ballpark figure of this number. And you need to make sure then that you break down your fulfillment and that you... It fits within that number, essentially. And one of the things I try to communicate to people is that like, only breaking even or even your campaign costing a lot of money, you should kind of expect those things, especially with your first campaign and maybe even your second one. And your third one is probably when, it's going, when things are going to kick off or click. Because when have you done one of anything and it's been profitable? right? Like the first novel you launched, if you'd launched it at the right time when things were pretty good back in the heyday of of Amazon, then that could have done pretty well. But generally speaking, when you launch your first novel, you need a few novels because number one, you're not very good at writing if you've only written one novel, or you could be very good, but you could be a whole lot better because you need practice. And then once you've written a bunch of novels, they sell better because they're better written and you have a lot more wisdom and experience. And it's very similar with Kickstarter. You know, the first one you launch, you're going to learn a lot of stuff. So there's a lot of value in what you learn. It's not just what did you get in terms of your funding. Also, which something people overlook is you've got a couple of backers on there. Um, Mm -hmm. Or not a couple, but hopefully more than a couple, but you've got a bunch of backers. And that's, that's, again, the audience, something a lot of people overlook. But for me, that is the primary benefit of Kickstarter is you're building another audience. And though some of that audience will follow you onto the next Kickstarter and the next one and the next one, so it just keeps building. My approach is your first Kickstarter, if you've not run one before, you should look at that as an opportunity to learn and make sure it's very small, it's digital only, it's short, maybe five to seven days, ten days, and you can fulfill it very quickly. And the only reason you're running that Kickstarter is to learn and to get your name out there a little bit and just grow comfortable with the platform and the environment. And then the next one, you can build on that and you can increase your expectations and act accordingly. I don't know if that's helpful at all. No, I think I think that's helpful. And I think I obviously, I went overboard because I do have quite a decent sized audience already. But I did, for my pilgrimage campaign, I did only have a target of like something like, it might even have been £2,000 or something. <laughs> because I really didn't know what would happen with that book it was really a test and I learned a lot but like you said I buy a lot on Kickstarter short story sort of collection ebooks so a lot of my campaign pledges are like five dollars that's a lot of what I fund on Kickstarter and these are people who put up short story anthologies maybe they make a couple of hundred dollars or a thousand dollars or like you said small digital easy to fulfill and then I guess on the physical items the big thing for me was costing out the international shipping Mm -hmm. I mean that can really kill you right yeah shipping's a really tricky one so what I would recommend with shipping is to try to use something like backer kit so that you collect shipping after the Kickstarter campaign and do not collect it as part of the campaign. Now, there are pros and cons to both of those things, but like you said, if you include it, it, it can be tricky. So, one, one of the 
biggest problems you can run into with shipping is that you charge X number of dollars for a, let's say, hardcover book to be shipped to from the US to the UK or vice versa. And something like COVID happens and shipping goes through the roof. Mm-hmm. And you're only going to ship these things six months after your campaign launch. Now, you're okay because you shipped your stuff right after your campaign finished. And that was like, wow, okay. But most of the time, these things take time, right? And sometimes there can be delays and things in life happen. And sometimes you can take a bit longer to fulfill your campaign. And that's okay as long as you're open and you, you communicate with your backers. But essentially, this, ha- this happened to us, actually. Our second campaign. So our first campaign, I think it brought in... It funded at about $4,000 and it cost us $5,000 to fulfill. And that was fine. We designed it that way because we wanted to, we, we created a $2,000 cushion because we knew, hey, we're going to learn a lot of stuff here. We're going to build a little audience. And then a month later, we're going to do a much bigger Kickstarter. And that one did a lot better and it did six figures. But we had that trouble where we did it on backer kit, but we also did it a little too soon where it was like, let's collect shipping now and get everything together so we, we know exactly how many we're going to produce and ship, etc. And then there were a bunch of delays because there were shortages in paper stock and cardboard and we were struggling to find a printer. And then we went like six months overdue and time just kept going on and we kept getting turned down and pushed back by different printeries. And they were like, yeah, we have paper stock now. And then a month later, they're like, oh, we can't run your thing all of a sudden because we don't have that paper stock. Uh, and then by the time the shipping came around, it's like, oh my goodness, shipping is like three times more expensive than it was when we charged for it. So, <laughs> so however, BackerKit does allow you to separate the shipping from the Kickstarter campaign, which could be very helpful in that case because you don't know what's going to happen. And you find that the, you know, it, when you're starting out, it might be, wow, that seems like a lot to ask for people to back a Kickstarter and to pay for shipping separately. However, that's the culture. That's what people, a lot of people, expect in that environment, right? That's people have been doing this for years if they've been backing campaigns, so they're used to it. So mm-hmm. it might be a little bit unconventional, but that's just how people do it on Kickstarter. Yeah, I think so. I've done two campaigns and I didn't use Backer Kit, but partly because I was kind of a bit scared of it in a way. I was like, I it take, it's going to take me a lot to learn how to use one system, the Kickstarter system. So do I have to learn how to use Backer Kit as well? So could you talk a bit more about it and when it's useful? I guess we've talked about the shipping side, but why else would someone use the Backer Kit? Because of course it costs more. Uh, they take another percentage, don't they? They do, they do. But it's kind of more than covered by the convenience that it creates for it processes a lot of the stuff in the back end for you essentially so backer kit started out as a pledge manager which is just something it's a way for to help you fulfill your kickstarter campaign or whatever campaign you could be using a different platform so if you run a kickstarter it used to be that for whatever reason kickstarter didn't build this in the beginning all you could do on kickstarter was launch your product on there people could come and back you and they send you the funds at the end of the campaign. So they, then you could fulfill your promises to your backers. But they had no way of dealing with email addresses. And if you wanted to get shipping information, you had to email, send out a survey and individually to people. And it was just like a really big headache admin-wise. So BackerKit came along and they're like, hey, we can create a plugin type of application which can do all that for you. Uh, So all you need to do is hit a button, we'll import all your backers, we'll send out all the stuff, and we'll automate everything. Now, there is a learning curve, of course, Mm. but it it does take a lot of the pain out of it. Now, Kickstarter have since brought about their own pledge management thing, but BackerKit has ingrained itself so much in the culture. It took took Kickstarter so long to get there that BackerKit's the go-to pledge manager at the minute. So the pledge manager is great because... It allows your backers to go and look at their pledge. What did I get? Do I have to pay shipping? Can I add stuff on to the pledge? Because back then I didn't want to get this thing, but now I see I do want this thing so I can add it on. So the pledge manager also allows you to cross sell and you can increase your total funding by 20 to 30% Mm. um, using the pledge manager. So that's outside of collecting shipping. It does shipping, but it also does cross selling. Now, BackerKit also have something called BackerKit Launch, which is like a crowdfunding-specific mailing system. 
which is extremely powerful because their deliverability is really high. And that's like maybe our number one uh, converting tool when it comes to promoting our Kickstarter campaigns. And then they have something called BackerKit Marketing. And BackerKit Marketing is where they run Facebook ads for you, but you need to have so many campaigns under your belt and you can show that, hey, when you launch a Kickstarter, you can guarantee it's going to make X number Mm. of dollars and that you can cover that ad spend, but that can be very effective. And they now have BackerKit crowdfunding, which is just an alternative to Kickstarter. So BackerKit know what they're doing is what I'm trying to say here. And they have some very powerful tools and there is a learning curve, but like anything, it's worth learning those tools because they can take your Kickstarter campaign to a whole different level. Mm, Right. Okay. You've convinced me. (laughs) I think I was just like, oh, I I just can't deal with another thing. Plus, because I had finished my book and I got the weight and I I costed out the shipping kind of exactly and I knew I would ship them, I was able to do that. But I can see the benefit of waiting on shipping. Okay. So I did want to return to that merchandise because at the beginning you were talking about maps and posters and miniatures and cards and all and a plushie. So (laughs) are there any recommended services that you have or any recommendations around the physical products it depends on what you want to do so if you're going to if it's going to be books you have to first figure out am i going to do pay uh, print on demand right so if you're only going to do a few dozen books maybe even a few hundred print on demand might be a viable option but once you start getting higher numbers you're kind of looking at maybe an offset print run Maybe first a digital print run, but then an offset print run where you, you kind of like it's going through a, a printing press at a manufacturer's warehouse somewhere. So because it, it becomes an economy of scale if once you get to like a thousand copies of anything. Um, and the same goes with manufacturing. So when it comes to manufacturing things like that, there are a lot of services where you can do, if you're doing merch like mugs or uh, t-shirts, hoodies, pencils, pens, stationery, that kind of thing. There are lots of services online that you, you can do that and they'll actually create those on demand as well so it cuts out a lot of the admin and the shipping on your side when it comes to things that are very custom like dice or maps plushies you kind of do have to shop around for manufacturers yourself so we've worked with different people in in lithuania some people in canada some people in china taiwan and to be honest with you we've had really good experiences all over the place so I can't really recommend anywhere in particular because it just depends what you want to do. But we try to manufacture as much as we can in one one place because Mm. then it it can all be shipped out together. So, for example, if we are going to do a big print run of 3,000 books, hard copies in China, well, then it makes sense to also do our dice there if we can and our plushies if we can because then it's all going to be shipped together to the same warehouse in the United States and then... The, our fulfillment partner will take care of it and they'll also send a bunch to the UK. Whereas if, you, if you're if you kind of like, you have three or four manufacturers doing different things around the world and then you have to coordinate it all going to the same place and that can get a bit messy. So that'd be my tip. If you're going to manufacture things and it, you're doing it yourself, which is a lot of fun, it's also a lot of work and you yeah. don't want to overwhelm yourself by having so many moving parts moving all at once so number one try and keep it all as close together as you can but also build build up towards it don't decide hey i'm going to do like 10 different products all of a sudden like you don't want to do 10 you don't want to do 10 new products all in one campaign trust me i've done it (laughs) and it was not a good idea (laughs) Uh, so maybe start with one or two new things and then on your next campaign add another one or two new things and eventually you'll have this catalog right but don't do it all at one time. Yeah, it's so interesting. And I think this comes back to, we talked earlier about the difference between the retailer centric model and this kind of direct sales model. And it really is like, we thought we were running a business before, but we weren't running a business. We were just authors using all these retailers. And now this feels like the proper business. Yeah. <laughs> this yeah. is like an e You know what? We are now trying to build our own Amazon, basically, our own little Amazon in our little corner of the world that we want people to buy from. And so it feels like this, if authors are like, I don't want to run an author business, then do not do this, basically. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And the thing is, it's like, when, when you put it that way, it sounds like it's more difficult. And that's because it is. But the thing is, if something's more difficult, that means most people aren't going to do it. So if you are a person who does do it, well, that's going to put you in a very advantageous position. So 
uh, for anyone who's maybe thinking, oh, that sounds like a lot of work. It's like, yeah, it is. But once you do that work, it really pays off and it's worth doing. Yeah, and I've talked, obviously, I'm, I am very pro-AI. I love a lot of the AI stuff, but mm-hmm. I, I am also aware that there will be a tsunami of AI-created stuff on easy platforms, yes. but there's no way an AI bot is going to do a Kickstarter campaign with a plushie. <laughs> no, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> or even a beautiful book with gold foil like I just did. So I think, as you say, it's the, um, it's the difficulty in getting to market. And it's so funny, I remember coming into the Kindle world back in 2009 it was and the people who were coming out of traditional publishing who'd got Mm. hundreds of books back they jumped on and became the first kindle millionaires really because they had this big backlist and they took advantage of new technology to kind of get ahead of the pack and i i almost feel like that even though kickstarter is not new i feel like for authors it really is pretty new it is like i i've said this before i like kickstarter for authors is kind of like we're Amazon for authors was back 10 years ago. Yeah, uh, exactly. There's a lot of opportunity. It's still in, it's an infant in terms of its maturity and its development as an industry. And we've seen a few big players come along and bolster that market a little bit. Such, well, a, a lot like Brandon Sanderson, as you mentioned earlier, right? And we're going to see more of that in the future. And as that grows, the opportunities are going to grow with it. And if you're here now, and you can take advantage of those opportunities, awesome. If you come along in 10 years' time, it's going to be like, well, it's not as easy as it was back then, inverted commas. <laughs> yeah, easy and hard. It's so funny. People are like, oh, it was much easier to be big on Kindle in 2009. <laughs> yeah. and I'm like, do you realize there was nothing? That we yeah. had to hand code our mobiles back then. <laughs> yeah, uh, there was no vellum to like format yeah. everything for you. And, yeah, there was yeah. nothing. There was absolutely <laughs> There was no like ad systems. There was there, there would there was just so and there was hardly any customers because people were like I would never read an ebook. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I know it's it's funny how things. It's not that it was people think it was easy, but it was just different. It was a different yeah, kind of different. hard. Yeah, yeah, and that's where we are now with Kickstarter, obviously. So I did want to ask you before we finish up just one last question. At Twenty Books Vegas, mm-hmm. uh, I was on a panel with you, which was amazing. But then you did a solo session on how to do a six figure or seven figure kick. Kickstarter campaign. So what are the hallmarks of those bigger campaigns? We've said people should start small and digital only, but how do we plan a six-figure campaign? It is a matter of starting small and getting bigger gradually, but also that is, can, assuming you don't have a huge audience, you can bring to the table right away. You know, if, if you're Brandon Sanderson and you tell people you want to do something, you can bet they're all going to be there. But if you're not Brandon Sanderson, it's going to take you a bit longer and you need to learn the platform and build your audience over time. And one of the most powerful tools for doing that, or even for getting a little bit ahead of people, or I don't want to say as a shortcut or fast-tracking things because there isn't really any such thing, but as a way to gain an advantage, you can really leverage that pre-launch campaign or that pre-launch portion of your Kickstarter campaign. So start three months out and start promoting it and I mean, you asked earlier, what are one of the challenges that, or what are one of the challenges that authors have and why are they breaking even or maybe losing some money on their campaigns? And one of the things is, as an author, you kind of approach Kickstarter as a store, like where you're going to sell a book. And that's not what people go to Kickstarter for in terms of the backers and the people who, who want to pledge to a Kickstarter campaign. Yes, they want the reward. That That is an expectation. However, people don't go there to buy something. They go there to be part of something that is bigger than themselves. They come to buy into something that gives them some meaning or to live vicariously through you as an author because they want to write a book, but they probably never will get a chance to do that. So you need to, your approach for people is, it's not just, hey, buy my book. It's, hey, come on this journey with me. Let's do this together. I'm creating this book, but like really we're doing it together. We're all in this. You're pledging this campaign and it's allowing me to do this thing and you're part of this thing. So rather than just doing the hard sell where it's like, hey, come get a book and you're pledging this amount and we'll send it to you whenever. It's like, well, this is a new thing. And have you ever wanted, have you ever wanted to write a book and you, you just can't get around to it or you don't know when you'll get around to it or maybe you never will just because you're so busy all the time? Well, then let's make one together. And it could be fantasy, it could be whatever genre that person's interested in. And when you frame things like that, people are just so much more engaged. So 
it's a bit it can be a bit of an adjustment when you're coming from one industry to the other but i think that once you make that adjustment it can make things a lot easier Yes, and it's funny though. I mean, I, I, my first Kickstarter campaign that I backed was Seth Godin's massive doorstop of a book over a decade ago, and I've been backing for so over a decade, and yet I didn't even think it would be right for me until last year, twenty twenty three. And it's so it's really interesting how I, I just didn't think I could do that, even though I was running like I was writing and publishing books that whole time. Yeah. <laughs> so it is interesting how it is a very different platform so I guess what I'm saying to people is if you haven't even backed anything on Kickstarter then you need to go do that you can't just run a Kickstarter without backing things right you have to understand the platform yeah and there's no better way to do that than to back it back one or a few and then you kind of become and you're like oh yeah so this is what it looks like and mm. that's what that button does and this is what a pledge is and that's what a survey is because the language on Kickstarter is very specific to crowdfunding as well there are a lot of terms and you're like why why is it called yeah why is it called that yeah why is it not a product and why is it funding and not sales or money or you know it's a story a story not a sales page (laughs) exactly it's all very but when you think about it after you've done it a few times you start to realize oh yeah that there's a reason behind these words and these words Mm. actually matter because it sets expectations for the people who are pledging but also for you as a creator funding for example isn't like hey i've People will come and pay for those products and now this funding is the income and now I can go what, do whatever with the funding. It's like, no, that funding is there to, to fulfill that promise and to create that product. And that's why it's not called sales. It's called a pledge. So, yeah, it's an interesting one. Yeah, no, so exciting. And as you say, this is another platform. This is a different mindset. It is, uh, there's a lot of business involved. And thankfully, you have a course. So I've only been through a little bit of it so far. So tell people, including me, what can we expect in the course? And where can they find it? Oh, yeah, you can find it on kickstarteruniversity.com. If you type Kickstarter University into Facebook, it'll also bring you to the Facebook group. It's a private group, but anyone can access it. And we post material on there and tips and tricks. Essentially, it is designed to take you from one Kickstarter to having several Kickstarters under your belt so that you can then confidently go off and do whatever it is you want to do with crowdfunding. The way I look at it is the price you pay for the course you should be able to make that back within the first year of taking the course because i'm confident that if you do the course and what we say in the course that it is going to do that for you and it's not just for authors it's for any kind of creative or online entrepreneur so it could be you want to create comic books shoot films maybe it is you're an author and you want to do novels or you want to experiment with transmedia and try a tabletop role-playing game in dungeons and dragons or an animation or who knows there have been people on kickstarter who have funded potato salad like <laughs> po- like literally a, just potato salad now kickstarter have since changed their rules and you can't do that anymore <laughs> but it, it just shows that you can really just experiment with things and try new things and the course is designed to take all the guesswork out of it you know i've learned a lot i've made a lot of mistakes done a lot of trial and error over the last several years and it's kind of like designed to take the sting out of it from that point of view so hey here are my mistakes don't do those but what you should do is this thing and there are a bunch of step-by-step guides which take you through your first kickstarter so you kind of talked about this on our panel in 20 books vegas joe and i felt this way myself when i launched my first kickstarter i was terrified Mm -hmm. and even just hitting the submit for approval button not the launch button like this is way before the launch button it's just submitting it for approval i was so afraid to hit that button that i hired a consultant to come along and pretty much hit it for me (laughs) (laughs) that's awesome (laughs) and and then when it happened i was like oh what was i afraid of that was silly but but i I was afraid and i think that's just a legitimate thing for people it's something unknown it's new and people are going to be afraid of it so i want to try and take that fear out of the equation for people as well and that's what the course is all about Mm. well we only met at at 20 books vegas and i i really love your kind of gentle approach that's how i feel your tone is it's quite gentle and supportive i don't know if that's your goal but that's how it feels to me <laughs> <laughs> i'm glad you feel that way i don't know if i do that intentionally or whatnot yeah, but <laughs> well, i think that that's just you and so when i met you and you were talking and i was like oh 
I literally I'd emailed you and said, oh, you backed my campaign. I didn't know who you were. And then we met and I was like, oh, OK, I really want to learn from you. So that's why I'm in your course and I'm really looking forward to doing it. And you've really helped me today, even just with your answers. And so, yeah, just so people know, I'm not an affiliate of your course. I am. I'm an enthusiastic fan. <laughs> So I hope people do that. As you say, if they launch a Kickstarter using the help, they will be able to make the money back anyway. So just also tell people where they can find your books and anything else you do online. Yeah, you can find uh, paddyfin.com is kind of the central place to get me. P-A-D-D-Y-F-I-N-N.com. And that links to several different things. Or if you're looking at, want to see novels that I've published, one of my pen names is Killian C. Carter, and I publish science fiction under that pen name. Haven't done so in a while, but circling back to that. So you can find that on Amazon and take a look at some of the material I've put up on there if you're so inclined. Brilliant. Well, thanks so much for your time, Paddy. That was great. Thanks very much, Joe. Have a good one. So I hope you found the episode interesting and that Paddy's calm, relaxed manner makes you feel more open to selling direct. And remember, start small and build up to bigger launches over time. And remember to set up your pre-launch page. Mine is coming soon for Spear of Destiny. So let me know what you think. You can leave a message on the show notes or a comment at thecreativepen.com or on the YouTube channel, or you can email me, joanna at thecreativepen.com. Next week, I have an interview on Your Author Brand with Isabel Knight, who's a publicist, and we talk about how to get to the deeper levels beneath your writing, the story behind the story, as well as why brand is even more important in an age of AI and much more. Plus, I share something I don't think I've shared before on the show. In the meantime, happy writing, and I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening today. I hope you found it helpful. You might also like the backlist episodes and show notes available at thecreativepen.com forward slash podcast. You can also get your free author blueprint at thecreativepen.com forward slash blueprint. If you'd like to connect, you can tweet me at The Creative Pen or find me on Facebook at The Creative Pen. See you next time.